Thank you, Nate. Um, thank you for moderating that great panel. Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, that was excellent, very interesting. Um, we have a recording of this and we'll also put the slide presentations up uh, for anybody who wants to see it later or maybe share it with any of their colleagues. Um, so I would like to start uh, introducing this next keynote session um, that will go until 1030 Eastern time. Um, this is a session with Diego Mesa. He was appointed Minister of Mines and Energy of Colombia in June after having served as Vice Minister of Energy for nearly two years. Uh, previously, Minister Mesa has also served as an economist at the IMF um, here in Washington, and he was head of the Bogota Office of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, Minister Mesa is overseeing a very large and very important portfolio for Colombia in this critical moment. Um, the government is taking major steps to advance clean energy, including intermittent renewables and energy storage. Uh, in the oil and gas sector, there are critical plans to advance pilot projects for fracking, and the government is undertaking a royalties reform. Um, so there's, there's really a lot at stake right now. And um, well, I, I think it's um, excellent for the country that somebody with so much experience and so capable is, is taking this over. Um, and I'm really interested in hearing um, what Minister Mesa will say about these issues as well as others. Um, so he's going to start off with a, a presentation um, and then afterward we will have some time for a Q&A discussion so I can take some questions through the chat if, um, or, or through the email if anyone would like to send them. Um, so Minister Mesa, please go ahead and, and start your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. Thank you very much for this invitation. So it was good uh, to be in this forum, uh, which I've participated in the past. I have a, a brief presentation that I'll go over, as you said. Uh, I think it'll take me you know, 10, 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll go into the Q&As. Um, and I think I'll be covering uh, most of the topics that you mentioned uh, in your introduction. Uh, so let me share my screen really quickly here. And if you can confirm that you're seeing my screen. Um, Yes, so I'll, I'll start uh, with, you know, what we're seeing globally uh, to um, jumpstart economy after, you know, what happened with COVID. I, I think uh, the theme for, for this uh, session, which is upheaval and opportunities, is, is very well suited. And I'll, I'll, you know, try to go over what we are doing in Colombia. Uh, in the energy, uh, oil and gas sector. And I'll touch very briefly at the end on, on mine because it's connected uh, to some of our initiatives. So, you know, I think worldwide what we're seeing is policies that are directed to create jobs, which is something that's been obviously affected by the COVID in Colombia. Uh, we reached an unemployment rate of 20%. Uh, last month, the number came down to 16.8, which is good news, but still pretty high. Um, or, you know, for Colombia, because we were used to be uh, below two digits uh, up until the, the, pandemia, the pandemic. So uh, the second one is obviously to boost economic activity. And third one is to take this opportunity uh, to improve our energy sustainability and resilience. And as we're seeing in, in most of the world, you know, uh, the policies uh, for the energy sector are focusing on diversifying uh, you know, power generation sources with incorporation of renewables, uh, intermittent or variable renewables, um, making also transportation much more sustainable, uh, energy efficiency, both uh, at the industrial commercial level, but also residential level, uh, level, having cleaner fuels, and obviously, you know, innovation in uh, different other areas. So I'll, I'll touch on that. And, and just to remind you, you know, why this sector is so important, uh, to the Colombian economy, even though Colombia is not a large oil and gas producer, uh, the sector, including energy and mining, is key to, to the Colombian economy. When we look at the contribution to GDP uh, between power generation and oil and gas, but if we also add utilities such as electricity and natural gas, this is the second uh, uh, sector in Colombia uh, contributing to almost 13% of GDP, um, but also it has relevance in other macroeconomic variables. Uh, oil and gas and mining provide up to 12% of uh, national government revenues. And when we look at exports, the sector is responsible for 
more than 50% of total exports and more than one third of uh, FDI. Also is a key sector for uh, the economics of the regions, uh, especially to royalties. Royalties made up 30% uh, on average of the investment budgets of the local and provincial governments. Uh, so we do see COVID as an opportunity to you know, continue to pr promote what we call more sustainable growth. Uh, and we're basing this strategy uh, on four axes. Uh, the first one is to accelerate our energy transition process, which I'll touch on this in a minute, uh, both with the incorporation of unconventional renewables, uh, but also with new technologies such as storage, and I'll, I'll touch on that as well. Uh, we also are focusing on uh, sustainable mobility and we have different strategies that are being uh, implemented uh, and roll over uh, during the COVID and we're seeing very good numbers uh, on, on that front. Uh, we continue to focus on energy security, uh, basically, you know, trying to increase research both on uh, oil and natural gas. And finally, you know, very briefly on diversifying uh, the mining sector, which obviously is connected to both uh, energy and the energy transition. Um, Lisa mentioned uh, the royalty reform. I think this is key. Uh, you know, since we came into, into power in August 2018, we've made significant changes to the tax regime applying to capital intensive industries such as oil, gas, and energy. Uh, but we also uh, develop policies in the National Development Plan to make uh, energy transition and uh, variable renewables much more attractive. Uh, and, and that's good because we have, you know, a very good um, uh, environment from a tax point of view that has helped uh, jumpstart this, these two sectors uh, over the last uh, uh, 24 months. Now, uh, we, we've taken another significant step towards creating a better environment for oil and gas and mining. And this is the royalty reform. And this is how the royalties are distributed. Uh, across the regions, because as I said at the beginning, uh, royalties are key for the uh, public finances of the local and um, provincial governments. So here, we just passed this law. Uh, it was sanctioned by the president last week, but as uh, you know, we made significant uh, uh, improvements to the way these royalties are distributed. And I think the, the first one is the most important one because there was a, a reform that took place in 2011, 2012, in which the distribution of royalties to the producing regions was significantly reduced and this obviously created an uh, environment that was not very fair, favorable for developing new mining and oil and gas projects because the communities in these producing regions felt that they were not seeing the benefits uh, of uh, extractive industries up front. So we've changed this and this required uh, a change to the constitution but also a new law implementing those changes. And the first point is that we increase uh, the distribution to producing regions from 11% to 25%. On that 25%, it includes uh, the opportunity to advance uh, royalty payments to the producing regions or to regions that have expiration going on so they can see uh, the benefits up front. And the, the promise that we made was that we were going to increase more than double the distribution to uh, producing regions uh, without affecting uh, other regions uh, that are not, not producing oil, gas, or minerals. So we kept uh, that distribution at 34% for all the departments in Colombia or departments or provinces, and we were also able to increase the distribution for uh, the poorest regions in Colombia from 10.7 to 15%. Uh, there are other um, aspects that are interesting in this law. Uh, for the first time, we have a uh, specific distribution for environmental protection, uh, which is 5%, which we, we think it was something that the, the, the country was asking for. Uh, so that was a good, you know, a good direction to continue to promote, obviously, more sustainable development of mining and, and oil and gas sector. And we also increase uh, you know, the um, distribution for education, for science, technology, innovation, uh, which is also key. And you may be asking, you know, how we were able to increase uh, the distribution for all these uh, sectors without uh, reducing others. And the, the response is that we decided to uh, prioritize investment over savings. 
So we did reduce, uh, you know, the, the amount uh, of the royalties that we're going into savings uh, for intergenerational equity, because we do think that is the moment is now to invest in the regions. So we reduced uh, the savings, which were 22% down to four and a half percent. And now moving to, you know, the projects that we have on this plan to jumpstart uh, the sector and economy with um, prioritize 33 projects uh, between the three sectors. Uh, the, these 33 projects are expected to uh, come into, into operation over the next two to three years. Uh, total amount of investment that will take place is uh, over 9 billion US dollars. And we expect to create about 54,000 jobs. Uh, this is the, the distribution between energy, uh, oil and gas, and mining projects. Uh, in energy, um, we did uh, two auctions last year, so now we're accelerating uh, the construction of these projects. All this is obviously privately led, uh, but we have 14 uh, projects between uh, wind and solar farms uh, that will make up uh, 2,500 megawatts of installed capacity by 2022. This is a significant increase from where we are now. Uh, our power matrix, power generation matrix, only has uh, less than 1% of um, variable renewable energy, uh, and we're gonna go to 12% by 2022. Uh, it's important to, to note here that we have extremely high number of projects uh, that already have uh, connections approved by the planning unit in, in Colombia, and we have more than 8,000 megawatts uh, of projects that are ready to build. And we're seeing the sector uh, develop its own dynamics and we're expected to, to it grow significantly over the next two to three years. Uh, obviously, uh, this will come with other opportunities of investment as well. Uh, we have transmission lines uh, that will take place over the next two to three years. We have 16 transmission projects, uh, but we also have storage uh, systems. Uh, we'll launch the first auction for storage uh, in the uh, Caribbean uh, region of Colombia. This will be this will take place in the first quarter of 2022, uh, and this will go to help uh, alleviate some of the restrictions that we have in the transmission networks and lines in this region. I think this is uh, the first um, auction for storage at a massive scale uh, that will take place in this region, and, and we're very happy to see a lot of interest from different investors who already publish uh, uh, terms for comments. Uh, now we're incorporating those comments and the final tender uh, will come out um, next year. Um, we're also moving with advanced mirroring technology, for example, and infrastructure. Uh, we're developing an agenda on hydrogen and geothermal, which we will expect to have a um, roadmap to include those two sources of energy over the next year or 18 months. And as I said, uh, we're moving uh, on sustainable mobility very aggressively. Uh, on this front, we have three different uh, uh, fronts or areas of work. Uh, one is with uh, biofuels. We already uh, approved uh, a higher mix uh, for biodiesel, and we launched the first program last week uh, in Medellin, which is the second city in Colombia. Uh, the mix in Colombia, the regulatory mix is 10% both for ethanol and for biodiesel, but now with diesel, we're allowing uh, private agents to come and uh, in, implement a uh, higher mix. And we started with 700 trucks uh, with a 20% mix last uh, last week, as I said, and we expect this to continue uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, second one is the use of uh, natural gas uh, uh, for uh, vehicles. Uh, we already passed 600,000 vehicles that have been converted to natural gas, which is uh, obviously diversifying the sector. And we expect to have more than 800 uh, natural gas service stations in place uh, by the end of the year. And then on electric vehicles, uh, we passed a law uh, last year. Uh, it's been one year ready with different incentives, uh, including tax incentives, but also uh, discount uh, for technical inspections and exemptions from restrictions measures uh, that we have in Colombia due to uh, quality of air and pollution. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to say that in 2019, Colombia was a leader in the region on sales of electric vehicles. Uh, we uh, almost closed at 1,000 electric vehicles in total, uh, well ahead of other countries such as Chile and the Dominican Republic. Uh, we have a very ambitious goal uh, to reach 600,000 by the, 
by the end of uh, the 20th, 20th decade, so 2030. Uh, but we're moving fast and we're also working on uh, having um, um, hybrid service stations that will service uh, EVs uh, and fossil fuels as well. Moving to oil and gas quickly, um, you know, we've, as Lisa said, uh, we're focusing now on developing uh, pilots for unconventional uh, deposits of oil and gas. Um, and obviously this is one of our key areas of work. The regulatory framework is already in place. Uh, we're just finalizing the model contract for these pilots and we expect to award uh, the pilot projects uh, to uh, private companies by the end of the year. Um, obviously we have, uh, you know, a situation in which reserves both on oil and gas uh, are, uh, it's critical. We only have six years left for oil, 80 years left of gas, and we were working to make sure that we have more and more uh, blocks awarded uh, going forward. Uh, we're focusing on uh, another cycle uh, of licensing rounds with the a &H. We did two last year and you know, after a period of more than five years without signing uh, new EMP contracts, we signed 31 contracts in the first two years of this government. Uh, we will have a third round uh, in approximately one month and a half. Uh, and then we are already planning the fourth cycle to allocate blocks, uh, EMP contracts in 2021. Another area of work is offshore. Uh, we're very optimistic with offshore. We have six contracts in place worth almost two billion US dollars in uh, exploration commitments. Uh, we do have uh, some of the mayors uh, in, in this area. We have Shell, we have Rexol, um, uh, former Nobel Energy, now Chevron is the operator in one of the Shell blocks. Uh, we also have ExxonMobil and we have obviously Eco Patrol. And uh, one of the news that you probably heard last week was that Occidental sold most of their onshore assets to focus exclusively uh, on their blocks offshore in ultra deep waters. So we, we do think that this is another area uh, that could bring um, uh, hopefully a lot of activity, but will also hopefully increase our reserves uh, in, the, in the medium term. Uh, to diversify our natural gas uh, supply, we're also launching uh, this month uh, the tender for a second regasification plant. Uh, this will be located in the Pacific uh, and we as expect to award a contract uh, in the first quarter of 2021. Total capacity would be 400 million cubic feet per day. And this will also go with a uh, new gas uh, pipeline uh, from the Pacific to the interior of the country. Uh, and just to close very quickly on mining, uh, the reason I, I usually like to talk uh, about mining when I'm talking about energy uh, is because uh, with energy transition, uh, Colombia does have uh, a lot of potential in some of the um, metallic minerals that are needed for the energy transition, such as copper and gold and nickel. And we have four uh, large projects that are likely to either start operations or uh, the construction phase in the next two years. Uh, these projects are worth, uh, worth 4.5 billion US dollars in investment over the next 12, uh, two years uh, with uh, jobs uh, up to 12,000 direct jobs. And the potential to increase gold production in Colombia uh, by 40% and to have the first uh, big uh, copper mine in Colombia uh, in which we have you know, minimal uh, production at the moment. Um, so I'll close. So with that, I, I usually like to show this image uh, uh, where we have one of the main production facilities of uh, Ecopetrol in Castilla uh, that shows the, the production facilities for Ecopetrol, which also is using uh, a solar plant uh, to generate power for the production facility, but also has a uh, palm oil plantation, uh, which is you know, part of our uh, fossil fuel uh, mix uh, that it's uh, mixed with uh, biodiesel in this case. So this is to show how the sector works uh, harmonically and you know, we were betting uh, on this portfolio approach in which we believe that we have uh, obviously a strong potential uh, in conventional uh, sources of energy, unconventional renewables, and also uh, biofuels. And I'll end with that and I'll open up for questions, Lisa. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Minister Mesa. That was that was excellent. Very comprehensive, and it's interesting to see how um, everything that the government is doing in these sectors ties into the economic recovery that's going to be so important for Colombia as well as other countries. Um, I have a couple of follow up questions. Um, one just brief specific question. Um, you in talking about the pilots for the unconventionals, you said that the first should be awarded by the end of this year. I was wondering if there's any specifics on when the first well might be drilled, you know, if you have a sense of that. Sure, yes. Uh, so we expect to, to sign those contracts uh, in November and December. Uh, the next phase after we sign the contracts is for those companies to get uh, environmental licenses. So the last piece of regulation that came out uh, last week was the terms of references for those licenses. And we expect them to uh, complete the environmental impact assessment uh, in the first half of 2021. And we, we expect to see uh, the first uh, uh, drilling activity uh, at the end of 2021. Um, we have a goal uh, lease, and I think you know, this is what we believe is responsible with the industry, but also with the country, and is that we are able to evaluate uh, the pilot projects uh, before the end of the of the government, which is August 2022. And um, my next question, I also wanted to ask you a bit about um, downstream. Um, so, you know, the the lockdown measures that were enacted to fight the the pandemic um, led to a decline in fuel demand in Colombia, as in pretty much every country in the world. How is that affecting the sector? Um, has, has there been a recovery? What's the government's response been in terms of policy or measure or for, for gasoline demand and, and the downstream sector in general? Yes, we, we did have a significant decrease in demand. I think uh, when I divided uh, the three main fuels, uh, gasoline went down uh, about 60%, especially uh, in the second, third, and fourth week of April. Uh, when the lockdown measures were uh, at the most strict point. Uh, diesel uh, decreased by about 30-40%. Uh, we continue to have obviously transportation of goods uh, and, and food and, and so on. So that didn't uh, go down significantly or, or as significant as, as gasoline. And obviously jet fuel uh, went down almost 90% uh, because we uh, had all the uh, airports closed uh, for about three three months or so, uh, but we've seen a significant recovery at least over the last couple of weeks. Uh, for example, uh, the consumption, the demand of gasoline last week uh, was the highest that we've seen since January, uh, and so we're now back to levels uh, pre-COVID, both on diesel and gasoline. Uh, obviously, jet uh, still has a long way to recover because the frequency of flights still, you know, very low compared to uh, the pre-COVID uh, levels. Um, what we've done during the crisis is that we did reduce the prices significantly, but we, we did this obviously because the, the prices worldwide uh, came down uh, in April, uh, in March, April, and, and May. So we had the uh, largest decrease in fossil fuel prices, uh, I think especially in April, we reduced the prices by about 16, 17%. And we've kept them stable since then, because we do believe that, you know, to continue to have this economic recovery, uh, we need to make sure that uh, transportation costs don't go up. So our response uh, was to, you know, reduce prices at the beginning, taking advantage uh, of the decline that we saw, uh, especially, you know, when uh, there was no agreement between OPEC plus and uh, oil and gas prices came down, especially crude came down uh, significantly. And obviously this was reflected in, in, in fossil fuels uh, as well. So uh, we're watching uh, the recovery, but we we're seeing pretty good numbers, uh, both on uh, gasoline and diesel uh, over the last two, two weeks. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and uh, turning to the power sector, um, I also wanted to ask, um, in discussing the energy transition, if you could tell us a bit more um, about the government's policy to drive distributed generation. Is there, is there anything, that, um, anything new that you could discuss there? 
to, uh, most of the policies that we implemented at the beginning of the government, both uh, in the Finance Act that we passed at the end of 2018 and the National Development Plan, created a very good environment for distributed generation. And what we're seeing is that this sector has its own dynamic now. And it's, it's incredible. Every time I go to a different city, uh, I see more and more auto generation and you know, companies, uh, small businesses, uh, taking advantage of all these incentives. Uh, remember that most of these incentives uh, have obviously a tax component. Uh, one of those is that we uh, increase uh, the time for uh, an uplift that we have uh, on investment uh, in energy efficiency and uh, auto generation with uh, renewables, such as uh, solar panels, for example, in which if a company invests $100 uh, in this uh, equipment, they can deduct up to 150 uh, from their corporate income tax uh, um, uh, bill. So uh, this 50% uplift originally was capped at five years, but obviously for new projects, that was not enough. So we extended that to 15 years, uh, and that's proven to be you know, a very good policy. We also uh, made VAT uh, exclusion or exemption automatic uh, for the equipment use in auto generation or uh, distributed uh, resources. And this, you know, this has helped significantly as well, uh, uh, the investment. So this sector is, you know, it's, it's, it's taken up on, at a very good pace. Uh, and we, every, every, every week we see more and more projects. Uh, and we also obviously are, are working on regulation to make easier for them uh, to sell, uh, you know, uh, the extra energy that they have to the grid, uh, that the operators, you know, allow them to connect to the grid easily and they can uh, net off uh, their energy uh, production and consumption. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, that sounds very, like a very comprehensive uh, policy framework for distributed generation. Um, and I also wanted to ask, um, in, we actually, at, at the Inter-American Dialogue, we published a report in June analyzing the climate change strategies of five last Latin American national oil companies, including Ecopetrol. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment um, on policies and regulations underway in Colombia to address greenhouse gas emissions from the oil sector, you know, whether that's Ecopetrol or private companies, what's happening on the regulatory front there? So uh, we, we're working now, for example, on gas flaring, uh, a regulation which we didn't have in place. We're getting uh, good technical assistance uh, from some of our uh, multilateral uh, partners, such as the IDB, for example. Uh, and we expect uh, to implement that as part of our regulation to reduce uh, CO2 emissions on that front. Um, what, we, what we're seeing is, uh, for example, from Ecopetrol, something that I think is very encouraging, and is that they're moving more towards uh, having uh, solar farms in their production sites. So I showed a picture of the Castilla uh, um, uh, well, in which they have one of the largest solar farms in Colombia, and that obviously goes to help mitigate uh, CO2 emissions uh, from, from their uh, activities. Uh, but obviously that goes along with savings on energy consumption, which, you know, obviously oil and gas is one of the main uh, users of energy. Uh, they're going for a second uh, solar farm uh, in San Fernando, which will be built uh, in the first half of next year. And they already announced a similar project in Rubiales, which is one of the main um, production sites as well. So we're seeing that, you know, Copetrol is getting into this um, expansion of, uh, uh, distributed uh, energy resources, as you were asking in the previous question, uh, but also thinking, you know, as a way to, to mitigate uh, uh, their CO2 footprint as well. Uh, the other thing that we're doing with Ecopetrol is obviously on the downstream side, uh, we have um, very ambitious uh, goals, especially on um, the quality of the of the gasoline and diesel that is produced by Ecopetrol in their two refineries. Uh, and this, you know, th this uh, fuels are uh, getting cleaner and cleaner every year. Uh, and especially with, you know, how much uh, parts per million uh, of sulfur uh, it has. In Colombia, uh, I have to say, Eliza, we're uh, more interested in the quality of air. Um, 
although we have obviously uh, international commitments on CO2 emissions. But the reason I said this is because when you look at Colombia comparatively with other countries, uh, we're only responsible for about 0.26% uh, of total CO2 emissions worldwide. Uh, but the quality of air, uh, which obviously you know has to do with uh, downstream side because it, most of it comes from uh, fossil fuels, it, it's a key topic in most of the Colombian uh, major cities. Right. Yes, and it's interesting. It was interesting to hear about what you're doing on the transport side too, which is more and more being discussed in the context of, of energy policy. Um, and I think if you have time, I could maybe ask you one more question. Um, sure, I have five more minutes, uh, Lisa, no problem. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I was, uh, in terms of the royalties reform, so as you said, um, you'll, the, the government will be able to distribute more royalties to the producing territories than previously. What's your sense of how communities are responding to that? Are they, and you know, local governments and local communities that have been, in some cases, active in blocking projects, is your sense that they are happy about this change? Have they been giving their input? How, how are they re reacting? And do you think this will help facilitate uh, things? Uh, uh, absolutely. This was one of the main, main goals of the reform. And the governors uh, of those departments in which we have oil and gas and mine activity uh, play a key, a key role in the discussion in Congress uh, to, to get to a place in which they see that they can get much more benefits uh, from uh, oil, gas, and mining uh, activity. Uh, so the, the, the communities are, are really happy. Uh, you can see this on the local newspapers that you know, they basically said that they regain uh, the territory that was lost with the reform in 2011 and 2012. Um, and, I, and I've been working with them side by side. Uh, they, they also are very happy because another um, part that was key to the reform was the decentralization process of the system itself. Uh, before most of the decisions on how and where to invest uh, the royalty resources had to go through Bogota, uh, we decided uh, to uh, you know, give this responsibility uh, to the regions. So they're not only getting more resources, you know, because the, their share of the royalty system in the producing regions went up significantly, but they also gain significant uh, autonomy about how to invest those resources. So th they're very happy. What we expect to see uh, is that they will become uh, the partners that they used to be of the sector. And we do hope to see, you know, a, a lot less activity against uh, oil, gas, and mining development. Uh, and and the go as I said, the governors uh, and the mayors of these uh, cities and departments where the activity takes place are extremely happy with the changes, and, and they've you know they've been a, a champion of the of the relative reform. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, um, you know, th thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. I, I know you have a lot going on right now. You're very busy and. Um, you know, normally we would have invited you to come here and speak in person, but uh, I'm really glad that we were able to do this virtually and we actually had many more people from different places than we would have otherwise. So, so thank you so much for your participation. No, Lisa, thank you very much again. As I said, it's a, always a pleasure to come to the dialogue and I look forward to uh, hopefully in-person invitation next time. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. Um, well, before we hang up, um, I just want to mention that uh, we're going to take a break from now until 12 p.m. Eastern time. At that time, we'll have our panel on energy storage uh, with a, a great group of experts and company representatives. Um, then at two, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern, we will have our U.S. elections panel with uh, former Trump and Obama Biden officials. Um, and then at, right after that, from 3 o'clock to 3.30 Eastern, uh, we will have our final keynote session with Assistant Secretary Francis Fannin, um, head of the State Department Energy Bureau. So I hope you all uh, will take a nice break and then join us again at 12. Thank you.